All right, so um, the general uh, question that uh, Pete and, and Daryl have been working on a lot in all their professional life, it's uh, uh, liquidity in financial markets. And uh, there are like three, I see three main questions related to that. First of all, how do we define and measure liquidity? Second of all, what are the fundamental sources that generate potentially liquidity in financial markets? And the third, for me that I'm a macroeconomist, is liquidity in financial markets relevant for real activity and real outcome? So let me briefly give an overview on this question. First, uh, what is liquidity? Um, I mean, there has been a, a kind of a consensus uh, of talking about two main notions of liquidity, uh, Brunner, Mayer, and Pedersen have a paper that have uh, kind of uh, emphasized this distinction and the link between the two notions, uh, market liquidity and funding liquidity, and both Pete and Darrell have referred to that. So what is market liquidity is uh, the ease uh, uh, of uh, doing trade, and the funding liquidity refers more to the ease of getting funding for traders. And there's a clear connection that goes both ways between these two uh, notions. So first, traders trade more if they can find uh, funding more easily. And second, uh, uh, funding per se may be affected by market liquidity, funding costs, because uh, it may depend on the resellability of assets and the value of the assets in, in the balance sheet of the banks that are getting the funding. So what are the main, uh, so I can talk about liquidity in general, given that these two notions are very interconnected, and what are the main sources of uh, potentially liquidity in markets? Uh, I like to kind of categorize them in three broad uh, uh, classes, although there may be others, uh, uh, micro foundations that are beyond these three. Uh, one, asymmetric information. Second, uh, trading <coughs> frictions. And third, the uh, funding constraints. So I'm going to give you a brief overview on these categories, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive uh, literature review. There are many people in the room that have worked more on that, and just uh, talking more of the paper close to the work of many of Pete and uh, um, Daryl. Uh, so first of all, asymmetric information. I'm going to talk more about that because I've, I've been working on that, so I know uh, the literature better. Um, so uh, when we think about the role of asymmetric information in uh, uh, financial markets, of course, we want to go back to the seminal papers on adverse selection in the 70s by Akerlof and Rocha and Stiglitz. Uh, and then there is a, a literature also building on Grossman and Stiglitz in 1980, thinking about uh, the effect of private information uh, in uh, financial markets on price informativeness. So the work of Kyle in uh, 1985 and then the following work of uh, 1989 is fundamental in the sense that has been uh, thinking about the role of uh, price information uh, uh, in financial market and the impact of price information on market liquidity. So it's the first uh, uh, work that think about the impact of private information on uh, uh, market liquidity. Following that work, there has been a, a lot of uh, uh, literature building on that and thinking about different wave, ways of modeling uh, private information in financial markets and their way in which uh, uh, financial markets work. So, uh, in these uh, uh, categories, there is uh, the important paper by um, Peter De Marzo and Darrell, uh, and then I've been working also in this, in this area with uh, Rob Scheimer, thinking about uh, search models uh, uh, with adverse selection. There is a, the second category is uh, trading friction, and Daryl has work, uh, talked a lot about that uh, and uh, gave a, a, a bigger overview on that. But the main idea is that thinking about uh, modeling uh, OTC market is important for financial markets, uh, given that this is a fundamental uh, feature of how the markets work. And uh, uh, the paper by uh, Daryl, uh, Gabriel, and Pedersen from 2005 is one of the seminal paper in this literature that, like, create, like, a build a model that has been used widely after that to think about OPC market uh, with dealers. And then uh, he has worked more recently uh, also on uh, um, how information uh, can be circulated uh, in uh, financial markets uh, uh, that are also affected by uh, OTC, I mean, uh, decentralized frictions. And then finally, there's funding constraints. I've been talking about that in the notion already in the interconnection between funding liquidity and market liquidity. Um, and, and I'm going to talk more about that uh, in a minute. 
Finally, third question. Uh, um, on the third question of how liquidity impacts on the real economy, I think we are going to hear a lot uh, uh, today, later today and tomorrow, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. But I just want to mention that uh, uh, the, uh, the impact of liquidity on, uh, real, uh, on the real economy has been a very exciting uh, um, uh, area, new area, re more recent area of, of, of research. And uh, there are many ways in, in which liquidity in financial markets can impact the real economy, mainly through the effect of balance sheet on different agents in the economy, starting from firms, households, and banks. And we will see more of that later in the conference. So I want to uh, go back uh, um, to the um, main point that Daryl has focused on today, so the role of funding cost. Um, and he has talked about uh, this idea that after the crisis, uh, there has been uh, an in, uh, uh, the, the space on the balance sheets of the dealer became more expensive, uh, uh, mainly because of uh, two reasons. So one, uh, the increase in capital requirements, and the other is the increase in dealers' credit spreads. And uh, he argues in, uh, in uh, the lecture uh, that uh, uh, he gave uh, that the increase in dealers' credit spreads is probably the most important uh, uh, reason why uh, the space on balance sheet of the, interme uh, the intermediary has increased, and so the liquidity in the market has decreased, and intermediaries have been uh, uh, reducing their intermediation activity. So uh, uh, let me briefly overview the, the, the mechanism. Uh, so suppose a dealer buys safe assets by issuing more equity. Um, this uh, improves the credit, the credit quality of the dealer's debt and so generates a transfer of value from the equity holder to the, um, to the creditors. And this implies that uh, um, this, this is the debt, a debt of a rent problem that makes uh, shareholders like, more reluctant to increase the balance sheet uh, and, and capital requirements could potentially intensify this, uh, this issue. Um, although probably this has not been the main channel because after the crisis uh, banks became safer, safer and so potentially there is less scope for improving credit quality and so for the, this channel to buy. So the other channel that uh, uh, may be important in thinking about how recently debt over rank may, uh, problems may, may have been more important uh, is uh, relating this to the cost of, uh, um, of uh, uh, funding for dealers. So related to the paper um, by uh, Daryl Anderson and Song in 2008. Uh, and so here uh, I'm going to uh, review the main uh, marginal uh, condition uh, that, uh, um, that, that, that Daryl has, has referred to, uh, which assumes that uh, the fault is unlikely and the interest rates are low. And so the idea is that shareholders find profitable uh, to purchase new asset only if the price of the asset is substanti substantially lower relatively to the funding cost. So here I'm looking at the marginal decision. So if I buy a, a one unit of asset that gives me a market value of E uh, expectation of epsilon of uh, Y, um, I, I want that market value to be higher than the funding cost, where U is the per unit marginal funding. Uh, uh, to buy the asset, that in a simple model is just the price of the asset, and S is the dealer's uh, uh, one period credit spread. So shareholders are going to uh, buy new assets only if this condition is not negative, and as you can see here, if spreads have increased, then the condition becomes tighter, and so there is a, uh, the debt over rank problem, problem becomes uh, worse, possibly uh, uh, hurting the, the level of intermediation in the market. So now I want to think a little bit of the link between uh, this, uh, um, this uh, work and uh, information going back to peak work in uh, 1785. <laughs> and so uh, let me think a very, very simple model just to uh, think if there is an interesting interaction between the two. So uh, think about an informal trader who knows the valuation of an asset, V, which is normally distributed. And there is a measure of uninformed tra noise traders uh, that are also normal distributed. Um, and the informed trader sets a demand that depends on the valuation before knowing, uh, without knowing the level of demand from the noise traders. And then there are uninformed market makers who set the price uh, to clear the market also without knowing what is the demand that comes from the, the informed trader and the uninformed trader. So the price can only depend on the sum of the two demands, the informed uh, uh, trader demand and the noise traders. So, 
So now let me add a little bit here that is uh, if the foreign traders need to borrow to buy the assets, and it's going to face a spread as, and here again I'm going to simplify, as does not depend on the quantity of the asset, and the uh, default probability is, uh, is minimum, so I'm going to think that this is a good approximation. Um, so what's the problem now? Uh, the the shareholders <coughs> are going to choose their demand to maximize their pro expected profits that are going to depend on the uh, valuation of the asset, the price, and the uh, spreads. Uh, and mm, when they show that uh, uh, the price is going to have, uh, is going to depend on the spreads, of course, and in particular lambda, that is the price impact uh, Pete uh, uh, has emphasized in his, uh, in his uh, remarks, uh, is going to be a function of the spread, and in particular it's going to be an increasing function of the spread. So what's the mechanism here? So typically what happens is that uh, the market makers uh, do not know what demand comes from the informed uh, agents, so when they see an increase in demand, uh, they are going to infer that probably there is a, the value of the assets is good because there maybe is more demand from the informed traders. But once there are spreads, the demand of informed traders go down independently of the signal that they receive, and so in general, they're going to respond more to a given change in, the, in their demand. And, and this is going to increase the price impact and also uh, imply a, a smaller price informativeness. So um, let me do another brief uh, um, uh, uh, connection between the funding cost problem and uh, uh, fire sales and other, another literature on, on adverse selection. So there is another question that uh, comes about when we think about adverse selection is uh, how do we think about fire sales? And uh, standard uh, um, uh, literature on adverse selection, going back to Akerlof that sees only sellers and the informed agents, uh, typically uh, has this kind of puzzling uh, implication that if you have a fire uh, sale episode, so there is more distress in the economy, the informed sellers are going to be the ones who sell more, are going to sell the better assets on average. And so in general, the adverse selection problem may actually be mitigated. Uh, so I've been working the, with Rob on a paper that shows that actually if you have a general equilibrium dynamic model, this is not necessarily the case because you are going to have a, a response of the general equilibrium value of the funds uh, that in expectation of potentially being distressed is going to go up and so make the adverse selection problem worse. But another way of looking at that is uh, a little in the spirit of Kurla 2017, think about a situation where sellers are informed but buyers have heterogeneous information. Now, if you have a, if a, um, funding illiquidity uh, is going to reduce uh, trading of informed dealers, so if you have a higher funding cost and dealer, informed dealers are going to trade less, then potentially the marginal trader may become uninformed, and so the adverse selection problem may become worse. So, so I think this is also an interesting area of uh, uh, research. So back to the trading friction, to funding costs and trading friction, there is important uh, questions about uh, what is the right market structure. And uh, um, uh, given that OTC markets are, are, are opaque and dealers do not compete with each other, uh, Darrell has emphasized in his work um, uh, uh, that dealers uh, actually uh, may, that the debt covering problem of dealers may reduce uh, if you have uh, a multilateral traded platform or in general if you increase competitiveness uh, among, uh, uh, among dealers. Uh, this is going to help because if you have dealers with differential costs of funding, uh, uh, typically, if you have more competitiveness, you're going to have the dealers uh, that uh, have the higher cost uh, and they're going to charge uh, higher prices, possibly trading less because of the competition that they face. So, uh, what, uh, um, what are, so this is a very exciting area of research. I think it's very important to think about liquidity and, the, and, and then financial markets and, and possible policy. Uh, there are, I think, three important challenges uh, still open in the literature. One is to measure liquidity, and uh, that's what Pete uh, uh, has been uh, uh, working on and, uh, and doing an important step forward. The other, I think it's interesting, uh, is uh, like, uh, I, I try to, to, to give you this idea of how funding costs and informational frictions may actually have interesting interactions, and so they may be interesting and useful to think about them together. And then, of course, uh, there is the, 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 the real economy side, uh, and that, so in 
the importance of embedding the richer model of uh, liquidity into a macro model is going to be important, uh, especially if you want to think about policy. And, and, and I think we're going to see some step forward in this direction the, later in the day.